Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to worship this morning. If you would, sign in on your attendance pad so that we know that you're with us. And um, if you have a prayer request, there are these little cards in your pew pocket. You can fill those out, and you can choose to keep it private or that the church can know. And if you would, place those in the um, offering plate later as it comes around. That gives us the cards so that we can keep you in prayer. I have a few announcements. The year-end giving statements are in a little <laughs> basket on the connection counter, and if someone does miss theirs and not get it picked up, we'll make sure we mail them, but if you want to grab yours today, you can. Wednesday night meals will start back up, and February 7th, I'm pretty sure that it's red pepper chicken. Um, but if you would like to take a week of the meals or lend a hand with those, just let us know, and um, we'll try and get February filled up. And then the United Methodist Women in Faith have their Valentine goodies coming February 11th. So if you would like to bake something for that, it can be dropped off at the church on the 10th. But otherwise, just come and, like, take some sweets home. That's how it works. You just come in, buy what you want, and take it home. If you are ready to worship... Please stand as you are comfortably able for our first time. Praise be to Jesus Christ, who reigns in glory over his church. For he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
In him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Through him, God was pleased to dwell in him and to reconcile all things to himself. Through us, may God be glorified. Would you pray with me? Jesus Christ, we give you glory and honor and praise this morning. You are our supreme head. And Lord, it is because you are the head of this, your church, that we allow you through your Holy Spirit, to change our lives and transform us more into your likeness. May you do that work in us today, we pray, through our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Well, as Marty was uh, stepping off there, <laughs> she said, that's one of my favorites. And I said, that was amazing. I love that we have a singing church. I love that we are a church that, that worships through song. Um, this morning, uh, as I'm getting back into the swing of things, my family just got back from a week at Disney, and we're not saying that to brag. It's just the way it is, and uh, it was a wonderful time. Uh, but we're getting to the end of January, and I wanted to um, do something this morning, and that was to express my gratitude uh, to this church. Um, Jackie made mention of it earlier. On your way out of service today, we hope you'll stop by the Connection Center uh, for, to pick up your, your giving statements for 2023. Um, we can give you those, and it can be just a, a transactional thing. You pick up your envelope and head out the door, and it'd be fine. But what I'd really rather us do today is recognize that inside of each of those envelopes is a response of faithfulness from each and every one of you. We, as a church, um, don't operate on a budget that says, if we don't have the money to do something, it can't happen. We operate around a mindset of faith that says, if God wants to do something, by golly, he's going to do it. But I would say this from the office side of things, it is much easier to do those things when we have the support uh, financially of this church. And you all do a wonderful job supporting the mission ministry of Tremont. And I want to say thank you. You need to hear that, that we are grateful that Pastor Jackie and I are so thankful for the way that you support the ministry of this church. And so as you give today, it's with a spirit of gratitude from us. Thank you that you give in this way. But our hope is also that as you give today, as the ushers are moving among you, that you also give with gratitude. Because scripture says that the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills, which simply means it's all God's. None of it belongs to us. We're merely stewards. But as you have been entrusted with these gifts from God, my prayer is that you continue to give as gratefully as you have done in the last year. Let 2024 be a year of giving with gratitude for you. And as the ushers move among us, let us operate from a mindset and a heart set of gratitude.
you pray with me? Father, only you know how you will use our gifts to impact the lives of many. But we have faith, Lord, that you will do amazing, wonderful, and abundant things. Lord, bless these gifts and they who will receive them, that Jesus Christ may be known in our community and around the world. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you please join with me as we uh, join in the affirmation of faith? We believe in one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the Savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated as we prepare for our next hymn, O Jesus, I Have Promised.
As we move to our time of prayer, I would ask you to take out your GPS, your Grow, Pray, and Study Guide, and find the prayer list there in the center. There are a few new ones added in there. Um, the family of Doug Tucker and um, uh, keep prayers going for um, Kay Summer as well. As we do each week, I would ask you to hold your GPS in your hands today as we pray over these people and then find a place that reminds you through the week to also lift them up in prayer. We will start this morning with a moment of silence to center ourselves in prayer. Just breathe. Allow yourself to breathe in the Holy Spirit. Exhale and let go of the many things on your mind. Share it all, your fears, your frustrations with God. Breathe in the Holy Spirit and let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, bring stillness to our hearts. Empty our minds of other things and direct our thoughts to those who especially need our prayers today. When we reflect on how you have supported and cared for us in the past, we cannot fail to give you thanks. When we consider the ways you give us courage and help us each new day, we are filled with a sense of gratitude and praise. When you lift us from the pit of doubt and despair, our whole being feels renewed and refreshed. What a comfort it is to know the love and support you bring to us through your Son and by your Spirit. In our joy, let us not forget those this morning who are feeling under the weather and those who are feeling hopeless. In our sense of gratitude and praise, let us not forget those whose lives are filled with regrets and heartbreak. In our feeling of support and guidance, let us not forget those who feel that they have struggled against life's difficulties and disappointments alone and uncared for. In our, our desire to give you praise, do not blur our vision of the hardships in this life. For, Father, you are not only the God of this world, you are the ruler of your heavenly kingdom. Strengthen us while we live out our lives on this earth and guide us to show compassion and caring just like Jesus. Mighty God, you alone are our rock of refuge, our strong fortress, our hope, and in you alone we trust. We confess to you that we do not always share your love as we should. But loving Lord, we are holding these people, our friends, our family, in our hands. And Lord, we also have those on our hearts who need your perfect intervention. We lift them up to you. Here are many prayers, some of those spoken and everyone knows, and those things, Lord, that are unspoken that we can just not share with everyone, and we keep them to ourselves. You, Lord, know exactly what fills our mind and we trust that you know exactly the need. Be near today, Lord, to those who are facing upcoming surgery. Watch over them. Ease their fears. And be near to those healing from illness and surgery. We ask that you surround Kay as she recovers and bring comfort to her. Be with those facing upcoming treatments and guide their care teams to the best course 
of treatment. Be near to those struggling with loneliness and depression and to those who are grieving the loss of someone that they love. That they would feel the warmth of your presence walking right beside them through this difficult time. And be with those of us that yearn for your restoration, your healing, as we try our best to follow your lead. Your power and your righteousness reach the heavens. Hear us, your servants, as we follow you to the day when hope, faith, and love will be upon the lips of all of your children. These things we pray in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. These are the words of God. If you believe they are true, say amen. Amen. Well, it's been a strange month. Uh, Certainly the way we planned out this series, we weren't going to be um, iced out two weeks ago and doing that as a completely online worship service, but you all were able to bear with us, and here we are at the end of our series on on renovations. And just to give you a a kind of a recap of where we've been, um, we started off by talking about foundations. Of course, if you're going to do a renovation on your home, the first thing that you really need to consider is, is the home uh, that's going to be standing on top of the foundation, is that foundation going to support it? Uh, Because if it's not, then you've got bigger problems there. So we always start with foundations. And then over the next two weeks, we looked at uh, parts of the Christian life that that dealt with dealing with some of our junk and dealing with um, remodeling. And uh, actually, Pastor Jackie came to me uh, this last week, and she said, well, I don't know if we're going to have a church to preach to on, on Sunday. She said, I did a pretty tough job on the demolition Um, last week, but it's this understanding, right, that God has to be able to move some things around in our lives to to filter out some of the junk that that we've created to make room for his Holy Spirit, and have we allowed him to have that space in our life so he can inhabit us more and more. And today what I'd really like to do is for us to really just have a conversation about what I would call the finer points of of discipleship and uh, what I'm calling the crown molding of the Christian life. Um, I'll get into that by explaining that my father-in-law is a carpenter. And I don't know if you have carpenters in your family. Um, Jesus certainly had carpentry in his family. He learned from his earthly father, Joseph. And uh, I don't know much about carpentry, but one thing I know from my father-in-law is that every single room, in his estimation, is not complete until it has been finished with crown molding. 
And I, I don't know where this rule of his came from. I don't know if it's something he came up with. I don't know if it's something he picked up uh, in college when he was over at Western Illinois University. But at least in Jim McLeod's estimation, a room simply isn't fit for human habitation unless it has been finished with crown molding. And true to form, every single room in Rebecca's parents' house has crown molding in it. Guys, I think his Dodge Ram might have crown molding in it. I'm not sure. They love crown molding. But you know, in a renovation, crown molding is a finishing touch on what should be a job well done. It's not the kind of thing that you put up while the studs are still showing. It's something that you save for the very end. And that's because crown molding is the marker of completion. That you are almost at the end of the project. But of course, it's more than that, isn't it? My father-in-law would tell you, not only is it a sign that the end is near, but it's also a sign of excellent, superlative work. And yet, when you think about what crown molding represents in the overall scope of a renovation, it's a very, very small part of the overall project, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever watched those um, home renovation shows on, on TV. Uh, Rebecca likes to watch first-time flippers. Actually, I'm not sure she enjoys watching first-time flippers. She likes to criticize them. Uh, of course, being the daughter of a carpenter, she's telling me all the things that they're, they're doing wrong. And I said, well, I got that because they just put a hole in the wall, honey. But uh, if you've ever watched these home renovation shows, you'll know there's always this mad sprint at the end of the project, right? right? Like when they used to do extreme home makeover, like the last 12 hours were the most frantic, right? You'd see contractors and workers and crews rushing around almost obsessively to look at every inch of the house and ensure that everything is just perfect for the homeowners. And it's during this period where minor details come into major focus. Tiny imperfections are identified and they're fixed on the spot. And I've always been baffled, and maybe you have too, by the fact that why all this stress over what probably amounts to less than one half of one percent of, of the overall project? I mean, we aren't talking about the foundation. We aren't talking about uh, knocking down walls at this stage. At most, we are talking about finishing touches. Who cares if the trim isn't absolutely perfect? So for me, I say, why all that extra stress? But you know, I think it boils down to this. And this is going to be very important for the rest of this message. It's the finishing touches. Those tiny details that make the difference between building a house and making a home. How many of you are homeowners? How many of you know that there's a difference between living in a house and having a home? There's a difference, isn't there? The same is true in our relationship with Jesus. One of the promises of Scripture, Jesus said, I will send the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, and that advocate dwells within each and every Christian. But you know, the state of that advocate's dwelling place matters. It matters whether we've created a house for the Lord or whether we have created a home. And that's what I really want to get into today with you. I, I really think there is a parallel to this phenomenon in our relationship with Jesus, these finishing touches. Uh, as we grow in our maturity and our walk with the Lord, I think there's a point at which the changes that are happening in our heart and soul become less overt and they become more subtle. I've been blessed uh, to encounter many mature Christians in my life. Maybe you have too. And these are people that are usually much, much older than me. And I've noticed that there's a theme in the life of very mature Christians, people who are very, very close to Jesus. And it's this. Their relationship with Christ is characterized by tiny paintbrushes rather than sledgehammers and crowbars. In other words, they've reached a place in their friendship with Jesus where God isn't knocking down walls anymore. He isn't changing the layout of their life anymore. Maybe there was a time early in their life when they were new to faith where those kinds of renovations were, were necessary. But I think at, at some point, as you grow in maturity, the, the renovations become less drastic and they become more subtle in nature. And I think this is what really distinguishes a mature Christian because their life has shifted from one of major renovation to minor details. And so like the final stages of a home renovation, it's 
really a matter of fine-tuning. It's not pursuing good enough, it's pursuing excellence. It's chasing after God's ideal. I want you to know that's really where we've been heading throughout this series, toward this message, toward an understanding that our lives are made complete when they fully reflect Jesus. In a spiritual renovation, Jesus is the blueprint we follow. Now, in theology, we have a term for that, and that term is sanctification. And sanctification is just a fancy word for the process by which our life and our character aligns with the life and character of Jesus. It's the process by which our thoughts, our attitudes, our intentions, our behaviors, our words, through the work of the Holy Spirit, begin to reflect Jesus fully. Because the goal of the Christian life is exactly that. The goal of living this life is to look exactly like Jesus. In fact, John the Baptist said the famous line in in John's Gospel, John 3.30, he said, Jesus must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. That's the renovation that God wants to do in you and in me in a nutshell for Jesus to become greater in our lives and for us to become less. And so today we're going to look at that process of sanctification kind of from a 30,000 foot view. Because the reality is that you and I are usually too close to ground zero to be able to name the places where the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us and refining us. It's kind of like aging. You don't look much older today than you did yesterday. At least most of you. Fair enough. You looked in the mirror this morning, you don't look that much different today than you did yesterday. You look about the same age. But if you looked at a picture of yourself from 10 years ago, unless you're John Stamos or Dick Van Dyke, you notice a difference, don't you? You look older. And the same is true of your spiritual maturity. You probably didn't notice a big difference in your relationship with Jesus today when you woke up than when you went to bed yesterday. But you know, if you were to look back 10 or or 15 years ago, you might notice a big change in how you've grown, how your understanding has expanded, and and the things that you allow to bother you, and the things that you don't allow to bother you. And so if you brought your Bible with you today, I want to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start with verse 17, and we're going to take a wider look at the work of sanctification. And what Ephesians 4 does is it presents two very different portraits of your life. Two very different portraits. If you're looking at at verse 17, it starts there. And the first portrait is of a person whose life has been absolutely ravaged by the effects of sin. This is someone who is a walking train wreck of a human being. Someone, Paul says, who has a hardened heart, who has lost all spiritual sensitivity, and has even become separated from God. Now, these are just the effects of sin, not the cause. Paul names several causes, and they range from sexual immorality to lying to greed. And the point here isn't that this portrait that Paul is painting is an actual historical person. It reflects who any one of us could be at our very worst. And folks, it's a pretty troubling portrait. In other words, if there is a blueprint out there that leads us toward a lifestyle that fully reflects Jesus... Well, then it stands to reason that there must also be a blueprint out there that leads to the exact opposite of that. Fair enough? Paul's point is here that when we are left to our own devices, our default setting as human beings is to follow a blueprint that leads us down a bad path. If not for the grace of God, we would all be heading in that direction. We may not get there, but we would get somewhere around there. We may not make it all the way to Peoria, but we're at least going to make it to Morton. But the good news comes just a few verses later. There's a bad portrait of what we can become, but there's a better portrait. Because in fact, God doesn't leave you and me to our own devices, but in fact, Scripture says that He sent His Son into the world to save the world. Better yet, in spite of all the ways we get it wrong, and we do get it wrong, Scripture tells us that the purpose of Jesus coming in the first place was not to condemn us, but to save us. And it's the saving work of Jesus that makes a second portrait of your life possible. You don't have to be a train wreck. And just like the first, this portrait is also hypothetical. Really, it's an aspirational portrait. A portrait of someone who has become so wrapped up 
in who Jesus is, that they reach the pinnacle of sanctification. And Paul says it like this, becoming like God in true righteousness and holiness. He says in verse 24. And this is what sanctification points to. Sanctification is God holding a mirror up to Christ and inviting us to imitate that image. So if Jesus is your blueprint, then you should aim to build a life that looks identical to his. And really what Ephesians 4 does best is it invites us to ask some really tough questions around that. Am I actively building a life that leads to Christ? Or am I building the sort of life that leads to something else? Am I making decisions today that lead me toward the first portrait or toward the second? We can go deeper. Is there an unaddressed sin in my life that I keep coming back to again and again and again that is driving a wedge between me and my God? Am I withholding forgiveness from someone Because I can't let go of a past hurt. Do I have a problem with gossiping about others behind their back? Do I have a critical spirit that causes me to assume the worst about people rather than assuming the best? We could ask all of these questions and more. And if we can be really honest with ourselves, questions like that are a little uncomfortable. Sanctification is an uncomfortable process. Being made into the likeness of Christ is an uncomfortable process. The fact is, when we start asking those kinds of questions and, and putting ourselves under the microscope, you don't, ask those, you don't get asked those questions of other people. Those are self-addressed questions. You ask them of yourself. But when we start really putting our, ourselves under the microscope, we might discover that, you know, there are a lot of places for us to touch up before we declare ourselves a finished work. There are a lot of little places where where the paint isn't quite even. There are little nicks in the wall, little imperfections in what we've built, which can be a real discouragement for us if our understanding is that sanctification is all about what we bring to the table. In reality, it's something that God has to enable in us. And really, it's something that can only happen as we experience and interact with the grace of God given to us in Jesus Christ. Here's here's the bad news. You can't sanctify yourself. You cannot, by your own willpower, grow to a place where you are able to match the righteousness and holiness of Jesus. Can't do it. But here's the good news. God provides you with the grace necessary for you to grow in in that way and to grow in that pattern. The real difference between the first portrait and the second portrait, the first portrait of a life that is overrun by sin and the second portrait of a sanctified life isn't that one person went to a bar on a Saturday night and the other person went to church on Sunday morning. The difference is that one blueprint is characterized by what I can do on my own power while the other is characterized by what God's grace can do in me. It's God's grace, not our effort alone that tips the scales toward living a holy life that is pleasing to God. It is a profoundly life-changing experience when we are touched by God's grace. John chapter 4 tells um, a really famous story, and it may be a story that you're really familiar with. It's about a Samaritan woman at a well who, who met Jesus one day, And we know from Scripture that she was a woman whose life was absolutely wrecked by the effects of sin. And we don't know the full story. We don't know her background, but we know that she had evidently spent the best years of her life bouncing from one man to the next, to the next, to the next, looking for love. Such that by the time Jesus found her at this well in the heat of the noonday sun, we're told that she was on her fifth fifth husband, and because of that, had developed a bad reputation around town. Well, how bad was her reputation? Well, the women in town wouldn't associate with her, and her tender profile was so stale that even the men had stopped swiping right on her. In fact, they stopped swiping left on her, too. Nobody was swiping at this woman. And that's the problem. When people looked at this woman, they felt nothing 
for her at all. And in fairness, she really didn't feel much of anything for anybody else. The woman that Jesus encountered at the well that day was jaded, tired, cynical, and unwholesome. She was unseen, unheard, unpleasant, unloved, unwelcome, untouchable, and unreachable. This woman was the dictionary definition of a lost cause. And yet the testimony of Scripture is that Jesus changed her story in the space of one conversation. We're told that after one conversation with Jesus, this woman ran back into town and told her entire community about him and about what he had done for her. And the question that I'm left with, and you probably are too, is, well, what did that woman encounter in Jesus that changed her blueprint so profoundly? What changed a woman who was building her life on, on love that was unmet, disappointment, thirst, hunger? What would cause her to change to a person who would pursue Jesus at all costs in the space of one conversation? What did she encounter that day at the well? I think it was the grace and love of God. I need to say this. I believe that the grace and love of God changes people. I believe that it transforms them from the inside out. I believe that the grace and love of God can rewrite the story of your life. And most importantly, I believe it's the only thing that can really make us like Jesus. That's what I believe. What do you believe? Well, Philippians 1.6 says, The one who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Well, that means two things. It means, first of all, that Jesus will completely transform your life. And it means, second of all, Jesus will transform your life completely. We aren't a finished work yet. We aren't finished until Jesus has said, it is finished. The question I want you to ask yourself today is, am I willing to accept for myself what a complete renovation in Jesus looks like? And if you answer yes to that question, you need to know what that sort of life looks like. First of all, a fully renovated life in Jesus is a life of learning. I want to say this, living a life with Jesus is not a passive sort of, sort of lifestyle. You will get out of bed and you will get off the couch every single day if you are going to be serious about following Jesus. When we walk closely with our Savior, we will always be making new discoveries. Romans 12 tells us that an important part of life with Jesus is renewing our minds day by day. And as our minds are being renewed, we are better able to discern the perfect will of God, which means that every day as we're growing in Christian maturity, as we're growing in our walk with the Lord, we're going to find better ways to do life in God-honoring ways. I'm telling you this, there are things that are not on your radar today that the Holy Spirit will begin to put on your radar. He will open up new rooms in your life. He will open up new hallways that you didn't know that were there. He's going to pull back the boards that on the, on, the, on the shelter that you have outside you haven't gone into for years, and He's going to go in there, and He's going to prepare you for a new and fuller life that you didn't know was possible. And this is the first thing that you can expect to happen if you get serious about a sanctified life in Jesus. Second thing you need to prepare for is that renovated life comes with a roommate. Whenever you invite Jesus to fully indwell your life, when you invite the Holy Spirit to be that advocate, that comforter in your life, guess who's moving in? That's right. It's a cohabitated space. When you get serious about growing in God's grace, you're going to become more accountable to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God living within you. And because your heart is His dwelling place, the things that you do with your life suddenly become subject to His approval. Which, I'll say this, sounds really restrictive until you realize how much better that sort of arrangement is. So I've been married for right around 10 years now, and, and 
I've got several guy friends who are also married. One of the things that guys like to do, um, women, this may not surprise you, but one of the things that guys like to do when they get together, and it's just the guys, they like to talk about what their life was like before they were married and had kids. They like to remember when they were living on their own, all the crazy adventures they got, off, you know, got up to, all the things they did, all the things they should have done. And the thing that always strikes me is they forget what their house looked like when they were bachelors. I have never been inside of a bachelor pad that looked like it was put together by Martha Stewart. They say, you know what, I had so much more freedom when I was all by myself. And I said, yeah, but you know what else you had? You had laundry sitting everywhere that you never folded. There were a lot of showers that you didn't take because nobody was around to smell you. And you had a giant tower of pizza boxes stacked on top of your cheap coffee, cheap coffee table made out of recycled beer cans. Was your life really that much better before you had a wife and kids, before you had roommates? And my point is this. Yes, living alone may mean living freer, but folks, it doesn't mean living better. It is better to do life with Christ. When we live life alongside God, the Holy Spirit, we are in far better shape than when we go it alone. So yes, it's a life that comes with a roommate, but it is a better life. And the final thing I'm going to say is this. In, in Matthew 5.48, Jesus says to be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that verse gets a lot of bad rap. It, it has for 2,000 years. Well, when Jesus said that, he didn't mean that perfection means getting a perfect score on your first grade spelling test or else you're going to lose your salvation. That's not what perfection means. Actually, the word translated as perfect there is the Greek word um, teleos, which is better translated perhaps as wholeness or completeness. And this is where I want to leave it today. The, the invitation to follow Jesus today is to allow him to bring your life to completeness in him. To let him finish the work of grace that he began in you. To put the finishing touches on your life by allowing him to fill you with God's grace. And so my brothers and sisters, don't let Jesus start a project and not let him finish it. Let him do the touch-up work. Let him put on the crown molding. Let him examine your life. Look for the imperfections. And then by God's grace, he'll do an incredible work in your life, if you let him. Would you pray with me? Well, Lord, we give you thanks today. Because you are a God who doesn't leave us to our own devices, but you sent your Son into the world to save us. And Lord, not just to save us from our sins, but to save us to something better. And Jesus, you are that something better. Today, Lord, as, as I'm praying, I, I just want to issue a, a dual invitation. As you're sitting in the pews today, um, I want to invite you, everybody to just bow your heads and close your eyes. This is your personal time with the Lord. I'll guide you through it, but this is your personal time. If you are someone who is sitting there today, and you've been feeling throughout the service, throughout the message, that the Holy Spirit's just been putting a nudge on your heart, it may not be something really strong. It may be something very subtle. But if you've been feeling a nudge that says you need to make a decision about your life today, then I want to encourage you to be courageous in this moment. If you're someone who's sitting in the pew today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus today, you, you've never drawn that line in the sand. You've never made that commitment and said, Jesus, I want you to inhabit my life. I want you to save me from my sins, to be my Lord and Savior. If you've never made that personal commitment today, would you just raise your hand? Nobody's looking. Nobody's watching. But if you want to draw that line in the sand today, would you just raise your hand? Or if you're uncomfortable with raising your hand, if you would just call out to the Lord silently in your heart and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I have sinned against you. And I want you to come and inhabit my life and to save me so that I can live every day of the rest of my life for you. If you pray that prayer, I believe that Jesus will answer it right now in this place. And there's another invitation that I want to issue, and it's for those of you who 
have already made that commitment, but maybe you've been feeling that you've gone adrift. Maybe this series has been an opportunity for you to say, you know what, there is some renovation work that needs to be done in my heart and in my life. And if that's you today, and, and you're feeling that nudge that you want to rededicate yourself to the work of Jesus and to allow his grace to fill your life, once again, I would just invite you to raise your hand. Again, nobody's looking, nobody's taking uh, score here. But if you, if you would say that in your heart, that you want to get closer to Jesus today, would you just raise your hand? Or if you're uncomfortable, even in your heart, just to say, Lord Jesus, I want to draw closer to you today. If you've made that your prayer, I believe he'll answer that as well. And so, Holy Spirit, for every person in this sanctuary, in these pews, you know who is calling out to you. You know the hands that are raised, and you know those who are answering that, that call in, your, in their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would come in and answer that prayer and that you would fill them with grace. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to invite you to stand for our, our closing hymn today. And, and as you're standing, this is um, my favorite hymn in the entire hymnal. And not many people know it, so I apologize. But it's a great hymn because it gives you a full picture of the work of salvation in the life of a Christian. Not only accepting Jesus and saying yes to him once and for all, but every day saying to Jesus, make me more like you. If you'd stand and join in that spirit, let's sing, love divine, all love's excelling.
I'm glad that we serve a God who finishes what he starts. You know, that's the theme of all of Scripture, is that God is faithful in every season. But I love what the Bible says at the very end. It's in Revelation 3.20, where Jesus speaks and he said, Behold, I knock at your door, and if you will open the door and invite me in, I will come and eat with you. I want you to know that Jesus is always going to be knocking at the door of your heart. There's never going to be a moment where he steps away. But he won't force himself in. But if you open that door and you allow him to come in and dwell with you, he will change your life forever and always. Go forth in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.